Okay. Uh. Okay. We are live. We'll show Christina's banner. Hi everyone, we'll just start in a few moments, just um, waiting a bit for the virtual room to fill up. Okay. Excellent. And don't forget everyone to post your questions in the question tab so we can monitor them, archive them, comments, congratulations, suggestions in the chat. Okay, so I believe we should start. I am here with Rob Emanuel and uh, he is a geospatial architect with Microsoft, uh, working with, uh, with the Artificial Intelligence for Earth team. And tonight, or this afternoon, or this morning, depending where you are in the world, uh, he's going to uh, talk to us about the uh, planetary computer. So, Rob, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much. Yeah, so... Uh, I'm Rob Emanuel, geospatial architect at uh, Microsoft with the AI for Earth team. And yeah, I'll be talking about um, how we're using open source geospatial software to process, search, and analyze the data of our planet. Um, so I just want to take a second to talk about Microsoft AI for Earth and why we're the diamond sponsor of Phosphor G. I went over this in my talk yesterday, but I think it bears repeating. Um, so Microsoft is uh, committed to environmental sustainability. Um, we have an environmental sustainability that's focused uh, on the commitments that we've made around uh, this topic. And that's the team that I'm on. And the commitments are specific, right? We're committed to being uh, carbon negative by 2030. And not only that, but by 2050 to have uh, removed all of the carbon we've ever admitted uh, since the founding of the company to be water positive by 2030, meaning we'll replenish more water uh, than we consume on a global basis. Committing to zero waste, um, the goal is to achieve zero waste uh, for Microsoft's direct operations, products, and packaging by 2030. And then in 2020, we also announced uh, our commitments to ecosystems, including committing to protecting more land than we use by 2025. <clears throat> and also building a planetary computer, right? And that's the team that I work on. Um, planetary computers, fancy name for um, a lot of implementation of the sort of geospatial open source um, software and open data that we sort of all know to love. Um, so really, um, you know, thanks to Microsoft for for stepping up and, and providing support for the conference around the software that we use every day. And um, yeah, really excited to get the opportunity to talk to y'all and to um, you know support the this open, open source ecosystem. So the planetary computer has four components. I'm gonna talk about three of them today. Um, so sort of how we think about uh, this, the work, right? We have a data catalog uh, it's data sets, um, openly licensed data sets uh, that are useful for environmental work. Um, that includes satellite imagery, uh, but it also includes things like climate model projection, um, tabular data, like lat long observations of different species. Uh, we have vector data sets, it's um, kind of a wide, wide variety. Uh, and then we have APIs for making that data more accessible, right? Being able to search for the data that you need um, uh, and then utilize it uh, in the cloud. And so also a, what we call the planetary computer hub, which is a Jupyter hub deployment that lives next to our data and makes um, uh, developing uh, against the data a lot easier. So first I'll talk about the data and APIs. 
So this is a sort of high level architecture diagram of, of how we um, set this up. All of the data assets live in Azure Blob Storage. Um, and we use uh, what we call ETL, extract transform load processes as a project that um, containerizes uh, specific tasks for extracting metadata in the form of stack, um, as well as transform, transforming data sets to cloud optimized formats where um, needed um, and storing those back on Azure storage. Uh, and then the stack metadata gets shoved into a PostgreSQL um, database, which is powering the stack API. Um, so not only do we have a stack API, but we have a Tyler API that's running T-Tyler for um, being able to grab and visualize um, uh, clips of, of the imagery. And that's specifically around our sort of uh, more uh, raster based data sets. Um, and then we have a SAS token endpoint, which uh, gives users anonymous access to get a, to uh, um, a token with a specific expiry to access the data. I'll talk about that in a second. So like I said, all data stored on Azure Blob containers, right? Um, very scalable data store um, that supports byte range requests so that you can read um, you know, individual byte ranges uh, from cloud optimized formats like COG or SAR. Uh, the data is placed in the storage accounts. It's either like systems that we create to you know, go grab data and put it there, or we work with a lot of vendors and partners to um, actually do those types of transformations and just the data lands in Azure storage, or uh, we work with the data providers. Like for instance, NOAA has been a really great partner um, in putting, uh, incorporating, placing data into uh, Azure storage as part of their data processing. And the data is mostly stored in private storage accounts for some small data sets. Uh, we don't necessarily bother, um, but with read access SAS tokens generated by our data authentication APIs. So like I mentioned, um, there's an API that you can hit. You don't have to th authenticate against it, but it, you, you hit it, you get a, SAS to what's called a SAS token, share access um, token. And uh, that allows you to append it to a HTTPS URL for the data asset. And then once it has that sort of query parameter with the token, you can use it with REST area or GDAL or um, whatever sort of tooling uses HTTPS. Um, and that's uh, sort of a little bit of a workaround um, other uh, sort of storage, um, uh, solutions have requester pays where you can kind of like offload the um, price of access to the consumer. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have that feature currently. Um, so this just gives us a level of a control mechanism um, so that, you know, somebody's not downloading all of Sentinel-2. Uh, uh, we can sort of, you know, uh, control the, the egress um, uh, but it is, uh, you know, publicly accessible, and um, you know, should be a relatively good user experience. Feedback welcome. Um, and then, so cloud optimized formats are always preferred, right? So if we have data sets we're hosting that are not originating in uh, like cloud optimized formats, part of that ETL will transform it to cloud optimized formats. And we have a heavy preference for not modifying the source data, so trying to keep it in this original projection and all that stuff. Um, but we'll transform where appropriate. Um, for instance, like creating um, uh, sort of derived uh, um, process data sets that often live alongside the original assets. Um, but, you know, in cases where, for instance, with Go's, the projection information um, is so weird that it will break some tooling. Um, so for visualization purposes, we generate Web Mercator cloud optimized geotiffs um, from some of the bands. And so the ETL process um, is a container is tax execution framework uh, for running on Azure Batch, right? So we develop data, spe data set specific logic that um, will transform, you know, a specific data set, a specific data asset and derive stack uh, metadata from it. And then that logic is packaged into uh, an open source 
stack tools packages repository. So all of that code, all the code we use to derive uh, stack metadata, a modulo like some of the more trivial ones or ones where stack items already exist. Um, we're contributing to the open source so that you know other folks that are working with those data sets can um, benefit from the sort of hours of trying to figure out exactly how to encapsulate stack in the correct way for those data. Um, or if they you know, see issues in um, the planetary computer items, uh, they can actually contribute uh, fixes and things like that, report issues. And we've had a, a few instances of, of that. Um, yeah, and then so the ETL project sort of on the internal side um, is just a, our specific implementation of those pipelines configured for our data sets uh, and then a way to run them at scale um, on Azure Batch. So just a little bit more about that workflow, right? We have Stack Tools packages uh, that live on GitHub and then those uh, Python packages that are published to PyPy get brought in to our internal Azure DevOps rep repositories uh, get containerized into task images and published through Azure Pipelines to a Azure Container Registry. And at that point, it makes it available to our Azure Batch systems uh, where we can then either through manual submission or automated process, you know, spin up um, parallel tasks to then go and process that data. And like, you know, uh, historical ingest is, is, can chunk through a lot of data. So here's, you know, a fun, uh, Azure Batch uh, dashboard of about 10,000 cores processing away. I think, the, I think this was on Sentinel. And then so once we create um, the stack items for those data sets, right, those are all shipped into through another Azure Batch process, um, shipped into Postgres, PostgreSQL uh, with PostGIS, of course, for um, spatial querying. Uh, as well as um, a project called PG Stack, uh, which was developed um, through the work on the planetary computer with development seed um, to create a database, database schema, an extension, and also some Python uh, code for uh, loading and then doing really efficient um, searches on uh, stack metadata. And so that database is sort of the core of you know, how we're storing all of the information about our data sets. And then the APIs uh, use that data. And so there's a implementation of Stack Fast API, um, which is a Python Fast API implementation of, of Stack API specification. Uh, it was originally developed by Arturo AI and then moved over to Stack Utils, uh, where it's sort of grown. There's a lot of contributors and uh, sort of just growing into a de facto, um, at least Python-based uh, uh, implementation of the Stack API. Uh, we also run a Tyler, that's an implementation of T-Tyler. Uh, T-Tyler is, uh, the T-Tyler stack backend is really um, for the single item tile serving. And then just um, Monday or Tuesday, we released uh, a new version with the endpoint that has the T-Tyler PG stack um, Tyler, tile endpoints that allow for mosaicing results from a stack query. Uh, I'm gonna demo that so it'll be a little bit more clear. I'm gonna do that right now. So what I'd like to do is shift over this and kind of go through an example of a specific data set um, that'll hopefully you know, kind of crystallize things. So we with that Tuesday release, we also released um, Goes, uh, specifically, Go 16 and 17 data, the cloud and moisture imagery product. Um, but this is the stack tools package uh, that contains all of the logic that we uh, developed along with um, element 84 um, to extract the metadata and do some transformations, including cogifying uh, the, the CMIP and MCMIP bands. Um, so here's like the library functionality that actually derives the stack uh, metadata. I'm just kind of scrolling through code, sorry. But I just want to kind of show how there's a, these data sets are super complicated uh, and a lot goes into them. Um, so I see the stack tools packages as sort of an encapsulation of, you know, reading that 700 page product specification and, and kind of encoding all that information into Python code that we can then use uh, to, to, you know, actually extract that for each asset into stack metadata. 
So the ETL process takes this code um, and then runs it in a big job. This um, is just some log output for one of the jobs I'm actually running right now, uh, where we can see it's like creating cogs for each of the, um, the bands and the data quality flag bands. Um, and you know, it pro each, each batch worker processes um, a chunk, what I would call a chunk file of about 288 items. So we just kind of, you know, look at all the new imagery avail that's available, chunk them up into, you know, a specific chunk set and then create the stack uh, items as an ND JSON and then a separate process um, that's, you know, only a single process goes and downloads those. And um, why don't I, whatever. Uh, and then goes and uh, puts that into PG stack, right? So that's where PG stack comes in. Um, so again, this is schema functions and Python library for storing and accessing stack. Um, I think I've learned a lot about C SQL and, and what you can do with it through um, uh, studying and working with this code. Um, so it defines the schema for items and collections, but it also defines these <clears throat> database functions that really kind of take in, um, take in C CQL uh, and uh, transform it into a database search. Um, I haven't even gotten to the search function yet, but it's uh, highly optimized for um, searches that uh, order by date time and um, uh, yeah, and you can query on any sort of property within the item uh, so that's all stored as JSON B. So really cool project uh, optimized specifically for the type of API use case that we're deploying to. And then so again, our API, our stack API is an implementation of StackFast API, um, which defines, um, you know, a few different backends, just SQL Alchemy and PG Stack right now, but there's a PG Stack implementation for fetching all that information. And then the like, um, the app.py, is that right? Yeah. Um, the app is what defines the different routes, right? So all of the stack API specification is encoded in here as, uh, as various routes that then call out to the uh, client. And then so the implementation, you know, the implementation of that looks like this, right? We have our API stack v1 at planetcheckcomputer.microsoft.com. Uh, this is the collection for Go CMI. Um, and then this is a specific item. And we can kind of see that um, there's the original net CDF assets um, for MC MIP and also all of the individual CMIP bands, um, as well as uh, cloud optimized geotiffs, um, cog. Uh, cloud optimized geotiffs for um, the various bands. So we're holding a lot of assets, uh, various views into this goes data. And then so I'll point out that it also contains a preview link that if you open this up, it's just a simple leaflet uh, map of, um, of the asset. Uh, you know, of the item, so rendering an item. So this is a, a code is shot from Go 17. Um, and I can render this on a map. Uh, and again, that's through ttyler, which has uh, item tile endpoints. So this is our data, API data v1 docs, uh, item tile endpoints. But then also, like I said, we just released these PG stack mosaic endpoints, which is an implementation of uh, ttyler PG stack. It allows you to register queries uh, like CQL searches and then uh, tile them out. So here's the project, cute little ttyler, loves PG stack. Um, that's also in the stack utils repository. Uh, and that's what um, powers the Explorer tool that we also just released. Um, so you can see here, uh, I, I, I was really, really hoping to get to um, visit Uwazu Falls uh, this foster G, but I will get there uh, another time. I can't wait to, to visit your beautiful country, Argentina. Um, but so this is Sentinel data and, you know, you can spend a lot of time, uh, zooming around the map, um, uh, with Sentinel data. So this is all dynamically tiled. Um, for instance, I can, um, modify the different rendering options. These are pre-baked searches for now. Um, you can kind of see what it's searching on, uh, because of, 
uh, based on this, but in a future release, we'll allow sort of dynamic setting of the, the various searches. But I want to actually go to goes and sort of show the culmination of all of that processing and all of those APIs. Um, so this is an instance where we're like actually rendering the thumbnails in the original projection because it makes these nice uh, globes. Um, this is quite slow, I think, because of StreamYard. Um, anyway, and then we're uh, actually rendering it on the map um, in Web Mercator. There we go. Beautiful. I think goes imagery is super, super beautiful. Um, and then we can we have these like various filtering. So you can see that um, Go 16 and 17 is rendered on the map. I see them like kind of running out of time here. Um, there's also this explore results on hub, uh, which allows you to copy uh, this search and actually just spin up a new notebook in the planetary computer hub, which again, is just the Jupyter hub implementation in our um, uh, AKS next to the data. And then so we can actually start working with the data assets directly in Python. Um, okay. Demos take long, but almost done. Um, yeah, so I guess the last component is the Planet Computer Hub, which uh, my colleague Tom Augsberger is um, uh, working on, doing brilliant work. And uh, so it's open sourced uh, recently, just our implementation with some Azure deployment on how to like, um, do we deploy our uh, hub. Uh, and then, yeah, really it's a Jupyter Hub implementation that has all of the goodness of like the Pangeo ecosystem plus some other tooling baked into the containers and made available to users. Um, and then I'll just point out that if you want to deploy your own hub, uh, it's open source, you, the, the Docker images are published um, and there's instructions on how to actually deploy your own version, stand up your own planetary computer hub. Um, so last thing I'll just uh, mention, there's um, a call for submissions to this uh, Geo Microsoft uh, Planetary Computer Program. Um, and uh, uh, we're calling for researchers to submit proposals where they can utilize uh, the Planetary Computer and also the Planet NICFI data. Um, and uh, get some get some support for doing uh, environmental sustainability work on the Planet Check computer. And then I also want to thank all of our collaborators, the ones that we're you know using as vendors like Element eighty four, Xavier Development Seed, Hogu Land Rush, Make Path, um, partners like Radiant Earth, people we're uh, working with like Cartosa, Impact Observatory, Esri, Spark Geo, um, and not just that list, but also everybody who's contributing to this amazing open source ecosystem tools that's making the planetary computer possible, right? Standing on the shoulders of giants for sure. Um, and yeah, really appreciate um, all the work that everybody's putting in. So that's it for me. Thank you. That was excellent. That was excellent. Thank you very much for the for the presentation. I will quickly go through the questions. We have two at this point. Number one. Planning to do any point cloud data, how will COPC fit the stack cog model? Yeah, that's great. That's a great question. Um, so right now we're working on uh, pipelines that will produce EPTs um, that will be hosted and accessible through our stack API. Um, and then we're also looking to generate COPC um, data from that and start making that available to Jupyter Hub users, see, sort of seeing what, um, you know, how folks start using that that emerging standard. I'm really excited about that, how it kind of fits in with like the cloud optimized GeoTIFF um, ecosystem. And yeah, I think the visualization tools will, will, will come uh, next, but yeah, there's a var various types of data sets. Uh, rasters were sort of our first step, um, supporting that through the Explorer. Um, there's another, uh, Set of folk we're working with, Carbon Plan, who just released a really amazing czar visualization tool, and we can't wait to integrate that into the Explorer. Um, so yeah, starting with imagery, but definitely moving uh, to support, try to su fully support point cloud um, and other types of data sets. And, and I do think that like with point cloud data, a lot of the times people will just try to get rasters out of it. So we want to support that use case, you know, height above ground, derived products, etc. Um, however, I think that there's value in uh, providing those um, 
that raw point cloud data. For instance, uh, Tim Bailey in yesterday's session talked a lot about how they're using the point cloud data in a three-dimensional setting without rasterizing it um, for forestry work. So uh, yeah, that's that'll be coming over the next seven quarters. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Moving on. Uh, what steps do you take to convert standard GOT file into COG? GDAL, love it. It's the easiest <laughs> thing. GDAL output format COG. <laughs> it really, the, de the default settings are pretty, uh, pretty great. It does a lot of the right thing. And I had to check and say, okay, is it really doing the right thing in this situation? It 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 makes the right choices. So that's generally what, what we're doing with deflate compression and predictor equals two or predictor yes when when appropriate. Thank you. Third question, which further data sets do you plan to include? There's a ton. Um, <laughs> so good answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's all a, a lot of them not maybe not all of them but most of them um so right now we're working on the other sentinel um data sets we have sentinel one up on azure storage uh we're actually working with partners to uh do uh, train flattening uh, making some sort of you know uh derived uh products off of that that are a little more easy to work with um but also you know three and five uh, can't wait to get uh, hands on Landsat nine. I think that'll be really exciting. Um, but yeah, we have a long data backlog, and you know we're kind of a small team, but have a broader uh, vendor ecosystem. But yeah, you know, chugging chugging through it as fast as we can. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, fourth question: uh, Where can we go to make a feature request for planetary computer? For example, adding TensorFlow to the GPU server option. That's a great question, and uh, it should be like super straightforward. And I, we haven't really set that up yet. But my thought right now is that we'll have a, a planetary, you know, Microsoft or such planetary computer um, GitHub uh, repository that you'll be able to register issues, um, and that'll be like publicly visible, all that. Uh, but until then, really emailing planetary computer at Microsoft.com is the best way. Uh, but but specifically for the hub, um, the Docker images are on uh, GitHub. Um, so if you, I believe the documentation might say, you know, where to sit, you know, if you want specific libraries registered in, uh, included in that um, image to put an issue somewhere. Um, hope it, Tom would be the one to ask on Twitter. Uh, he'll just point you to the, the right GitHub repository. But yeah, hopefully soon we'll have like a, an easier front door for all these types of requests. Excellent. So the fifth question is, what are your plans for access control pricing for public use? So the current model is um, that the stack API is publicly accessible. The data is publicly accessible with this sort of access control of the SAS tokens. The hub is still in uh, a period where it's request or pays, and we're still working out sort of the model of, um, you know, right now it's just it's just free. When, once you have an account, um, there's some limits about how many machines you can spin up, what are the, you know, size of DAS clusters that you can spin up. Uh, but we're still trying to work out a model where, you know, we can try to support the environmental sustainability work uh, that's focus that's the focus of the planetary computer, you know, as best as we can, while also recognizing that, you know, the things that we're building are applicable in an enterprise, uh, you know, situation where it's about environmental sustainability or geospatial analysis in general. Um, so there's currently plans for, for trying to, um, you know, think through that stuff, but, but we don't have anything solid yet. Uh, okay, thank you. And 30 seconds for some comments about return of investment. I mean, I mean, yeah, I, it would take more than 30 seconds, but I'm going to like refer to some podcasts that Lucas Joppa, the chief environmental officer for Microsoft, uh, has given where he's kind of stated really directly, like Microsoft needs to be investing. I mean, every company needs to be investing in environmental sustainability, because if the world doesn't do well, then your company's not going to do well. So it's really like a serious commitment to, um, you know, 
looking looking forward to looking you know 50 years where where are we going to be at if we don't do this work now so the return on investment is like long term let's try to do what we can to um you know adapt and mitigate uh for the climate crisis so um yeah that's that's a 30 second answer great answer so thank you very much, Rob, uh, for your presentation, for your time, and for uh, for the uh, for your answers. And enjoy the rest of the phosphor G. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. -bye. Okay. Um, so uh, we are on time. Uh, maybe we wait just a few more seconds for people to change stages. Uh, so we um, we leave a few seconds for people joining. Okay.